I, I wanted to thank Michael Hagedorn for joining us this evening. Uh, I've known Michael for a number of years, uh, and several years ago, uh, both Florentina and I had uh, done some classes with him, and it was delightful. Uh, we did some wild and crazy things like the, uh, uh, the uh, I can't remember the name of it, the, the, uh, the, the, the hanging thing. I, I think, yeah, I think you were part of that Vine Maple Tower the Vine Maple. adventure. That, it escaped my mind, yes. Um, Florentina, <laughs> I'm glad Florentina, you were there. <laughs> Florentina, Florentina did the photography. Uh, Howard Greisler and I were out trying to find materials to put this thing together. <laughs> it, was a, it was a vision that Michael had. And uh, we all worked on it and had fun with it. So, uh, but but I hope that I hope that a lot of you have actually gone back and 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 looked at the retrospective, the artistic retrospective that Michael put together in his in his uh, blog, because um, you can. It was it was enlightening to me to understand. Uh, the extent of Michael's artistic background. Uh, it's not just um, bonsai, or I shouldn't say just not just bonsai, but he started out uh, doing artwork, you know, from his days in high school and uh, uh, drawing, painting, sculpture. And then he became a ceramicist of, of considerable note and did a lot of ceramics and a lot of um, uh, ended up doing uh, bonsai pots. And all through that process, he was also uh, doing bonsai. But as he points out in his, in his retrospective, uh, it was not particularly distinguished bonsai. It was just something he was doing. But then he had the opportunity to go to Japan and study with uh, uh, Shinji Suzuki, who is one of the most brilliant young uh, bonsai masters in Japan, and Michael spent several years with with uh, Mr. Suzuki, and from there, you know, the the bonsai work that he did just uh, blossomed. So, um, it's a it's a very interesting retrospective, and if you haven't looked at it, I think that David McPeters sent it out to everybody. So have a look at it. It's fairly lengthy, but it's very interesting and. Uh, um, and with that, obviously, the other thing that Michael does very, very well is, uh, is, the, is to write. And he's written two books now that I'm aware of. The first one is called Post Dated, The Schooling of an Irreverent Bonsai Monk. And that's a very entertaining and delightful book that I read a few years ago. And then his recent book is called Bonsai Heresy. 56 myths exposed using science and tradition. And uh, so I think the presentation that Michael is going to do for us tonight is based on that current book, Bonsai Heresy. And with that, I'll turn it over to him, Michael. Thank you. Thanks so much. You brought back some memories there. I'm sorry, as I'm speaking, I'm attempting to fix my view, my speaker view. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's funny. I was just uh, uh, joking. Uh, uh, with uh, my tech help here, how after a year and a half, you'd think we would have figured out all of this and everything would be smooth and effortless. And I apologize. I'm a, I was a little late joining because I had on my phone 6.45. Well, 6.45 Pacific time is what I had on there. So I really apologize. I'm glad I, I had a little little bite uh, that I was just finishing up when I realized uh, I had a phone waiting for me <laughs> calling. That, that, that's per, that's, so I'm very sorry. <laughs> that's perfectly okay because we were having our own techni technical problems in the meantime. So. <laughs> okay, so let's see here. I'll try and scoot over to, uh, uh, oh, so can I share screen? Am I a um, uh, um, co-host? Have I been, let's see. Uh, yeah, you are now. Yes, your co-host. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Great. I'm going to share share our presentation screen here. There we go. Um, does everybody see this? Okay. Yes. 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 Coming through. 
Okay, great. I'm sorry. I'm having a bit of a trouble with my with my mouse. This has happened before. Oops, I don't want to do that. Oh, good. We can see it. Don't get, worry. There, there we go. I'm just trying to delete the uh, <laughs> small the images there. Okay. Uh, all right. I think we're finally ready here. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. Gosh, I think it was years ago that I was at the, the club there. I don't know if I knew you, oh. Tom, but um, I, uh, I think I think it might have been Larry Jackal who brought me in. In any event, uh, uh, it was Excellent. fun fun to meet folks. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that? It was me. I, I oh, mean, yeah? It must have been four or five years ago, five years ago, maybe? Yeah, it must, yeah I think it was at least five. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's right. I think I stayed with you, right? Yes. Just starting to come back. That's right. That's right. I stayed with you. Okay. So, in any event... Um, <laughs> Uh, so uh, this is a little presentation I put together uh, after the publication of Bonsa Heresy, which Tom just mentioned. This is a book that came out in early 2020, um, and it, it is the result of uh, over over 35 years of mishaps and, and, and a few uh, haps, uh, which were the positive uh, <laughs> stories that I had to tell in the book, which, which actually were many fewer than the mishaps. In any event, um, many of those questions um, that uh, had developed over those 35 years or so of doing bonsai, although the first 15 of that, I, I wasn't very engaged, um, but uh, it ended up just sort of planting seeds for what came out as, as this book. Um, I'm hearing a lot of feedback. There might be some people that are not muted. Maybe if we can have everybody mute, then... Um, at, at the very least, I could concentrate a little more. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, so um, uh, I've chosen um, 12 to offer today, and I, I think that's as many as uh, uh, Sergio Quan did uh, the illustrations for. Uh, so, and I'll talk a little bit more about him as, as we go along here. Um, but uh, I had a great fun uh, working with him um, and his playful way. And, and this is a, a fairly uh, easygoing presentation uh, along the lines of Sergio. <laughs> so um, when we were putting this together, this was after the thing had been written and um, uh, we were packaging it, I, I was searching for something to put on the back cover, um, a quote of some sort or other. And I think one of the apprentices, it might've been Andrew Robson, uh, was looking online and he found this quote by Mark Twain that really summed it up quite well. Um, the, uh, the, the past decades of me flopping around in bonsai was, was, uh, was well put together with uh, this phrase, education consists mainly in what we have unlearned. Um, and we'll begin with uh, the technical myths and then uh, the, the second part of this presentation is uh, the aesthetic myths and, and the book is, is broken up into those two parts as well. Um, so we'll start with a, a, a phrase in quotations, which is how the chapters are in this book. And uh, I should point out that I believe the opposite of what is in quotations. I think that is what, what is in quotations is, is something that we might consider a myth, perhaps. Bonsai method should be exclusively based on science. Um, and when I went to Japan, I had a, uh, an adventure that uh, suggested that there was, uh, there was a lot more going on there. Um, <laughs> although I had a, a bit of a background in science myself, I have a, a minor in biology and my father was a biologist. Um, and I kind of grew up in that world. Um, and so when I went to Japan, I kind of assumed that, uh, uh, that, that I would be learning all the stuff that I hadn't learned in the States and, <laughs> and it didn't work out that way. But what I learned was that the Bonsar tradition is, is really based on, on the good stories and, and the bad stories are the ones that just sort of fall away. And sto by stories, I mean, um, uh, sort of, um, experiments that, or, or I shouldn't even call them experiments, but, um, uh, backyard adventures <laughs> where uh, a practitioner did something and maybe they were happily surprised at the results, even if they couldn't explain them. Um, and then that was talked about in the community and pretty soon many people were doing it. A great example is black pine decandling. Um, and the story of that uh, is, uh, is put into the book uh, just very briefly. Uh, it was uh, Sachi Suzuki and Sachi Suzuki was way back, back into the thirties uh, actually. And he was like the um, the, the grandfather of a certain clan there that uh, Boone Manick took apart, Kathy Shaner, Dennis Makashima, uh, all studied within that, that clan. 
uh, and their uh, their their clan grandfather, shall we call him, uh, create, uh, created this technique uh, because he saw some caterpillars uh, nibbling along on on, uh, on a few of the shoots of, of black pines uh, growing in the spring, and discovered that they regrew uh, later in the year. And the next year, he put several trees aside and cut them, and discovered he could control the needle length according to the date that um, they were cut. And I always thought that that was a fairly new technique from maybe the seven days. And it was an awful lot of fun to work with my colleague, uh, Jonas Dupuy, um, who had a book uh, that I was very curious about. And he helped me find a, a part of it that we ended up getting translated. And we realized that this it, it was, this was written by, by Suzuki, and we uh, realized uh, that this technique was a lot older than either, either of us thought. It goes all the way back, back to the late 30s. Um, so I, I learned a lot writing this book. <laughs> it was fun to, to run down uh, certain things that, that seemed to be cul-de-sacs, and they turned into, into things that were a lot more exciting. So uh, when I was in Japan, I, I, I learned there was a lot more to this, that, that, uh, uh, that the anecdote that I was starting to learn, learn from Baboon um, was really this sort of trial and error kind of uh, way of, of discovering how to work in a, in a physical art. Um, and, and science is very helpful um, in many different ways, particularly how we can um, uh, learn about plant physiology, uh, many of the things uh, that, um, that move the levers of of agriculture, um, horticulture, um, many things are, are pretty well studied, uh, disease pests and, and things of that nature. And then there's unfortunately uh, this, this other path that we're all very familiar with, which is uh, uh, telling all sorts of interesting stories that we, that, that we're, we think might be right, uh, but we have nothing to support it <laughs> with. Um, uh, and I was a, a pretty big part of that as well. But anyway, uh, <laughs> the, uh, what I, the, the idea I'd like to leave you with, with before we leave this chapter is, uh, is that a lot of the things that we think of as bonsai tradition, if they have come from overseas, we think of them as, as something that happened in the deep of time hundreds of years ago many of these things aren't you know defoliation of, of bonsai we just talked about the black pine but the defoliation of, of deciduous trees is is fairly new as well so um there's probably more to be discovered <laughs> so keep notes <laughs> you might help all of us uh, so one thing that i didn't get around because we started uh, uh in a lurch here um if there's one person uh who would um uh, maybe uh, help me out here. Um, at the end of each of these chapters, um, I, I would like to invite uh, all the participants uh, to ask questions through chat. And then if one of you, Tom or someone else, uh, would like to uh, read those, um, and then I'll try and answer them. And then, uh, and then we'll move on to the next chapter. Uh, that way we don't have to remember what we were talking about <clears throat> in a question and answer thing at the very end of the presentation. <clears throat> so again, I have about 12 of these little chapters and you're welcome to type in any questions that might pop up as you're thinking about them in the chat. Um, uh, keep yourself muted, muted, and then, and then uh, we'll have somebody read them. Uh, and I'll, I'll just call out and ask if we have any questions at the end of a chapter. So I assume we don't because I, I didn't say anything <laughs> about that. Uh, anyway, so we'll, we'll move on uh, to the next chapter. Uh, fertilizers. We're all very excited about fertilizers, uh, and this is one of uh, the chapter titles um, in Bonsai Heresy. Chemical fertilizers are for wankers, organic fertilizers are for wimps. And when I was studying bonsai years ago, this was a, a topic of, of, of high intrigue and, and, uh, and a lot of excitement. Um, and I saw some pretty, pretty crazy stuff, uh, <laughs> some very animated discussions. And, and yet I didn't really know the answer to this. I was very curious. Uh, and then having done bonsai uh, overseas and, and uh, using almost exclusively organics and, and using some chemical at, at, at various periods of time, I still didn't know really what was going on inside the pot, although I had some, uh, some evidence of what things looked like. So I was... Um, uh, I really enjoyed writing this chapter uh, because the storylines are so numerous uh, and also soil uh, biology is, um, is very complex. Um, and uh, all of the soil scientists that I talked with um, admitted uh, that it was very humbling. It, 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 it's so complex that, uh, that they can be certain of very little. Um, one thing um, that I was able to get out of a, um, 
uh, I'm sorry, a horticulturist that works up at uh, um, the University of Washington was this wonderful phrase, a nutrient is a nutrient is a nutrient, which uh, <laughs> which is her version of how the plant views nutrients. They don't really care about where it comes from. They can use any source. Um, the question really is, it, it, it is sort of how that looks then uh, when when the plant uses it. So she was she equated these with uh, sort of whole grain foods as opposed to um, uh, highly distilled foods uh, like white bread or something like that or pure sugar, um, uh, which are bulking agents. I mean, they are for us and for uh, for a plant, a chemical fertilizer is going to bulk it up a lot faster. Uh, it's readily available um, and um, the, you can't get an organic that does that. Organic has to sort of break down before it's available and the numbers are low as well. Um, so, uh, so there's a fair number of differences uh, and then how we apply it. I and mean, then there's an awful lot to talk about here. You can talk about solid fertilizers versus uh, liquids and they're both very useful. Um, although I would, I would highly recommend uh, if at all possible, using some sort of a solid fertilizer. If you can use a cake, that's great. It's really hard to over fertilize with a cake. Every time you water in uh, with any or uh, solid fertilizer, a little bit goes into the pot and a little bit leaches out. Um, uh, it, it's quite possible in the types of soils, the sort of volcanic soils that are popular for bonsai, it's very possible to flush out um, so much uh, fertilizer that you can end up with with tragically low nutrition levels um, and, uh, and and really stunt our plants a little more than we might want to. Uh, it, it, it's much better to try and use fertilizer as a gas pedal as opposed to water because water is also food, right? Water, if you, the plant breaks it down and it uses parts of it, um, the carbon. Um, uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, so um, uh, it's from the air, excuse me, and and your uh, your your plant is is then um, breaking down um, uh, the constituents <laughs> into uh, into parts and reassembling them uh, into into glucose, and the glucose is is powering the engine. So the plant uh, is uh, uh, is going to be able to use a, a, a chemical or an organic, it's going to be able to use a solid fertilizer, which is some, a slow release, or it's going to be able to use a liquid equally well. But I would say as a caveat, when you can use a slow release, because that way you're, you're not going to flush out to very low levels. Um, so then we just have to talk about, well, how much to apply um, and what kind of numbers we're talking about. And there again, I would I would recommend kind of low numbers, somewhere in the, the the mid single digits is common for maintenance. And if you're building young plants, you might want to uh, go higher into the double digits. But we did a little study, uh, which I filled out a little bit. I'll, I'll explain it briefly in Ponza Heresy um, uh, in the backyard. I had the, the apprentices run this little little study, and I was very curious to know if there was any. Um, uh, budding differences or caliper differences that we could see with the, sort of the same amounts of of, uh, of numbers with chemical uh, versus organic. And we did see some interesting differences. Um, the chemical fertilizers uh, tended to bulk uh, more and give a longer inner node. Um, and yet the organics tended to have um, good, understandably shorter inner nodes. Um, and uh, and in, interestingly, more budding. So that that was that was kind of curious. And so it does tend to suggest that it's better for maintenance. And so I think that kind of in this instance, I think it sort of supported um, tradition um, and what is traditionally used over there, which are these oil cakes, which you put on the surface of the soil. They're very interesting things. They lock in after just a few days. The mycorrhizae and fungus coming down, and it all just sort of uh, sort of locks in. Um, <laughs> uh, so they're very hard to brush off, which is one of the, the difficult parts of using things like Osmocote, which are floating around, um, and it's very easy to wash off very quickly. So the little tea bag idea is a pretty good one if you have a small collection. If you have a big collection, you might have a different, uh, different idea. <laughs> Do we have any questions for this chapter? Do we get any? Yeah, we have a couple. Um, Nicholas, great. So, yep, Nicholas. So Thank first you. question is, do organic yes. versus non-organic impact the mycorrhiza? Uh, some sources ah. suggest yes, and that's from Daryl Whitley. Uh, yeah, I agree. Some sources suggest yes. <laughs> um, 
it's interesting. If you look at natural environments, um, you find much more organic uh, areas, leaf litter and stuff like that. It doesn't have as high mycorrhizal growths as you would think. It tends to be in the subsoil where there's very low organic, where you see more mycorrhizal growth. Um, so this gives us a little bit of a clue, I think, um, so that in the volcanic soils that we tend to use uh, for bonsai, uh, that uh, you can get more mycorrhizal growth than if you are using um, organic soils to grow young plants, you're probably going to see less uh, uh, mycorrhiza filling up the pore space. Having said this, um, I, I've seen uh, it just anecdotally that that mycorrhiza grows in in using both uh, chemical and organic fertilizers. Um, that, there was one study that that seemed to suggest that some funguses grow better. Um, with chemical fertilizers, which was a bit of a surprise to me. <clears throat> um, but um, it, it, there again, I, I think there's, um, th there's a lot of uh, competing thoughts about that. And, and you'd probably have to dig into the primary research to get some real answers. But I think in, in, in our situation, uh, that, that there's, you know, a little mycorrhiza is a good thing and a lot of mycorrhiza is a bad thing. Uh, it, it can clog up your drain holes. And, and so, you know, optimizing things for mycorrhiza isn't necessarily our best idea really to begin with because pot culture doesn't necessarily need mycorrhiza. Um, so that's a funny, if you, if you do, just as an aside, if you do have really rambunctious mycorrhizal growth, you might try a dacanil drench, which can not knock it back. It won't kill it actually, but you kind of spray underneath uh, the drain holes. Repotting won't solve your problem. In a in a six months, it's going to be back again. Eventually, the roots seem to outgrow the mycorrhiza. Um, so I, I think our, our our understanding of mycorrhiza is still a little bit thin. But what we do know is that it takes a really heavy tax on the carbohydrate that the plant makes. It's about thirty percent. That's a really high tax um, for a plant. So once the plant doesn't need to do that, once the root system is really uh, um, uh, expanded to all corners of the pot and is really dense, the mycorrhizal growth often begins to decrease a little bit. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting thing to see. So if you're patient, <laughs> that can, um, uh, then you can kind of uh, outlast a, a mycorrhizal <laughs> um, uh, adventure. Uh, anyway, I don't know if that answered your question, but it, it seems like it, it, it's a very complex story, uh, mycorrhizal, and whether we want it or we don't. Um, so... Uh, a good question. Uh, interesting question. Okay. The uh, yeah. next question is from Joshua Stewart, and it's, have you experimented with inoculants? Oh, I did years ago. Um, and uh, I've read some reports that suggest they're not, they're not very efficacious. Um, it, it seems that if the plant wants it, it's probably going to get it. I mean, spores are everywhere. They float around and eventually in a, in a few years, or, you know, it's probably going to have it. Um, so, uh, so these are uh, inoculants that you buy and it has, you know, a whole spread of species in it and you water it in or something like that. Um, uh, I gave that up uh, some years ago when I realized I, I didn't really want any more mycorrhiza than I had. <laughs> and uh, there was, I, I mean, I have some plants in the yard that don't have it, but the endomycorrhiza, the, the mycorrhiza that's inside the root, we don't know whether we have it or we don't. Um, but the ectomycorrhizal plants like, like oaks and uh, beech and things like uh, pines in particular, pines are very obvious uh, and multicolored. Some of them are white, some cream, some of them I've seen are brown. They're really, <laughs> really, really interesting uh, organisms. Um, but I have, a, I have a tense love affair with them. <laughs> I know they help the plant. They help the plant take up water. They help the plant take up nutrition, uh, sometimes a thousand fold. Um, um, but there again, if you have a really established plant, you probably don't need as much um, uh, of that as we think. Anyway, a good, another good question. I'm afraid I don't have a great answer for you, but I, I think it's, it, maybe do your own tests with that because I never got around to doing that. Um, and, then, uh, and then consider expense. I mean, a lot of these, and we're going to talk about um, growth enhancers in a little bit, but a lot of the growth enhancers to me seem woefully expensive uh, compared to what you're actually getting. So, yeah. Another question? 
Yeah. Um, so this yeah. one's from Rich Katz. Michael, I use cakes. I also have a jar of mycorrhiza. What's a suggested method for introducing the mycorrhiza to the soil? So if you have a jar, if you've done some repotting or whatnot, you save a little of it. Uh, the traditional method is, is to sprinkle it uh, on the bottom of the next plant that you repot of the same species. Um, and that's, that's kind of an interesting method. I, I think it, 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 it seems to work. Um, but um, if the root ball that you, you know, that you already have mycorrhiza in the root mass that you're returning to the pot, you don't, you don't need to, to do that only with a, a plant that doesn't have any and might be weak. I mean, I think the only reason I would really maybe suggest mycorrhiza is maybe with a weak plant because it, 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 although it does take a tax, it also um, levels the playing field and stabilizes plant in terms of moisture uptake and nutrition uptake. Um, so you, you might try that uh, for a weak plant, but for a strong one, I'm, I'm not even sure I would suggest it. <laughs> so, um, uh, oh, and, and I'm sorry, was the half question about uh, organic fertilizer? Um, I think the question was just introducing the mycorrhiza to the soil. Oh, the mycorrhiza. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Any other and questions? The last question uh, is for me is uh, any suggestions for particular fer fertilizers that are less likely to attract pests, squirrels? Oh, birds, boy, that's a good question. That's a huge problem with organics, and many people can't use them because of that. In fact, we have some raccoons, and uh, we saw a skunk in the yard uh, a little bit ago. <laughs> we have a squirrel, but he seems very busy in the front yard where we don't have bonsai. Um, birds are a problem. Um, yeah, I'll get around to answering your question in just a second, but birds are interested in the grubs underneath the cake. And so they'll flip the cake aside and eat the grubs. And so you lose fertilizer. Um, it, uh, if you, one thing you can try for, for mammals, I don't think this works for birds, but you can try, um, if you make your own cakes, uh, you can add some cayenne pepper, um, and uh, if you don't make them, you can maybe make a little slurry and you can dip your, your, your dried ones that you buy in them. And that often makes them think there's something better to eat uh, out there. Um, but it's a big problem. If you, if you use fish emulsion, uh, the liquid, is, it's, that's, a, that's a nice product. It uh, doesn't last long in the pot, though. You got to keep watering. It's like every two weeks or something. It's a, it's a high turnover. <laughs> but, uh, but that can attract every feral cat in the neighborhood and uh, raccoons. And <laughs> so there are all kinds of problems with organics, <laughs> even though they're mild and, and um, probably the, the, the science does seem to be leaning in the, in, in the direction of supporting a, a, a fairly stable uh, biotic community in the soil. Um, and it's very hard to over fertilize with them. So if, if I was to make a recommendation and I don't do that easily, I, I would do organic. If you can, if you can't, there's no problem with using chemicals. Just be very careful about how much you use, maybe try an osmocote or something of that nature. The problem with osmocote is that it, when it falls beneath the soil surface, often it looks like there's nothing there and then you put more on and then you can very quickly get into an over fertilization problem, which is not growing a longer shoot, but actually getting chemical burn um fertilizer burn uh so that that's a bit of an issue um and we talk about that in the book too it's a little bit complicated but <laughs> anyway um good, great questions should we move we have, on we yeah have we have one? one more if you want to take it if we're not we can move on sure yeah that's fine okay it's a big big subject <laughs> yeah would it be a good idea to add mycorrhiza to recently collected yamadori this is from oscar mm. Oh, that's not a bad idea. Yeah, I mean, most of them have it. Uh, it might not be very visible because uh, mostly if you're collecting in, in duff pockets, um, it, you might not be able to see it very well, but it's probably there. Um, but yeah, you can always add some and <laughs> give it a whirl. <laughs> uh, but yeah, many of those trees are a little weaker, so it might give it an inch. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's, uh, let's move on. <clears throat> Next chapter. Uh, this is one that I, I did for years, actually. In fact, whenever I would repot, it would, it would prune everything, including my conifers. I didn't realize that was the wrong thing to do until I started starting with Boone. And I, I don't think it had really clicked with me until I got to Japan when we still didn't do it. <laughs> we didn't, didn't uh, top prune any of the conifers and often none of the deciduous. So I, that was always sort of ticking around the back of my head. It was like, wait a minute, I learned I was to prune. Uh, when you do that. So I, that, that was a, a question. I didn't really have an answer for that. Um, and I, I uh, started to get a better answer for that when I was researching this book. But uh, I did find that um, 
uh, conifers do tend to store a lot more, um, excuse me, deciduous store more, uh, more sugars, uh, usually in the, in the form of starch uh, when, uh, when they're dormant. And then as the, the temperature rises, that starch is turn, turned into uh, your, uh, your glucose again, so the plant can use it. Um, and uh, conifers, though, don't store a lot of carbohydrate. And it sort of makes sense because they can, they can photosynthesize at very low temperatures, some of them even down to like 20 degrees, which is a surprise to me. I didn't know that. But um, uh, so because the conifer doesn't store a lot, um, you, you want to keep those uh, solar panels out there uh, and not cut them off uh, at repotting time because you have to grow regrow the bottom essentially. Um, so this is one of the reasons that I, I mean it, it supports a lot of a lot of things that we do in, in in bonsai, which is is that we repot one year, but we don't really necessarily work on uh, you know heavy styling that year. We wait a good twelve months, or if you have a really short growing season, maybe even longer than that. Um, and, uh, and that allows <clears throat> one part to regrow the other. So if you're, <clears throat> if you're styling your tree and you cut a, a fair bit off, if you have a well-established root system, it can regrow, can help regrow the top. And, and, and often that'll pop a lot of buds. Um, on the other hand, if, um, if you're repotting, uh, uh, particularly for a conifer, leave a full top and then that, that top will help regrow the bottom. Now uh, we're talking abstractly here. So you might have something very different in your mind. If you have two roots, you, you know, with a big full top, that probably isn't going to work very well. I'm thinking about a, a fairly uh, 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 substantial root mass that you're returning <laughs> to the pot. Um, but anyway, that, that's part of the story. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, the um, uh, mature bonsai in, in Japan, I, I, in fact, I can't remember a single time that we did any kind of top growth on a conifer at the same at the time that we repotted it there was uh, occasionally some trimming done on a deciduous tree that that's always possible in fact pruning a japanese maple that's not a bad time to do it right when you repot especially big pruning because that'll stop your bleeding uh, it's one of those plants that bleeds a lot um and so there's some some definite exceptions here and for young plants you know all kinds of you know, we throw a lot of things out when we talk about young plants. And most of my comments here are, are about more established plants, uh, established bonsai. Um, but we have, I think coming up here, we have a, uh, a chapter about, um, uh, about young ones. Do we have any questions uh, for this? Doesn't look like we have any questions this just one? yet. Funny. I've given this presentation uh, more than half a dozen times. I don't think we've yet had a question on that one. <laughs> <laughs> not the most interesting chapter props probably or everybody's thinking, well i knew that uh but i didn't so i put it in there uh use a bigger pot to grow a bigger tree uh now this is one that uh i did very badly for quite a long time uh, it was just take a tiny little plant and i think oh well you know it'll just i'll just save time we'll put it into a bigger bigger uh pot and and the thing will grow harder this didn't always work that way and i wondered why <laughs> That was many years ago, but it was uh, fairly clear after I'd gotten a little bit of experience that 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 actually um, stepping it uh, slowly up to a big pot, uh, using a transition into a smaller, medium size, medium big, and then finally big uh, pot is 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 going to give you a much faster trajectory. Uh, uh, a stronger, more vigorous plant, uh, surprisingly, and the, the reason is that. Um, uh, we slow a tree down if we have uh, it in a, a too big a container and it can't dry out the soil fast enough. So if it's sitting in soil that stays moist uh, for too long in a pot, and we're going to talk about ground uh, shortly, <laughs> but uh, that tends to slow the tree down. Uh, the, the reason is that um, uh, primarily it, it is, uh, is oxygen. So roots respire as well and they need uh, oxygen and the only way they get it is if that soil dries out a little bit uh, 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 between waterings. Now, um, so if you have this little thimble full of, of soil, uh, it's not going to be very uh, very long before this thing need, needs an up pot. In fact, often it's just a few months. So nursery workers are really, really busy <laughs> because this is one of the, the best ways of 
of of ramping up uh, the the development of your plant is actually this this um, periodic, even within one season, repotting a few times is <laughs> not uncommon. Um, uh, it's it's more important than fertilizer. It's it's just it's just literally the physics of of the plant growing. Um, so I have had this question many times. So I might preempt it: Is why then when you plant something in the ground, does it not grow as fast? Um, uh, or and on the other in the first year, <laughs> on the other hand, <laughs> it grows pretty well shortly thereafter. The reason is that it's kind of colonizing that huge area. Uh, with roots, and then it usually takes off uh, in the second or the third year. Um, but but also the soil structure in the ground is very different. We don't really see it very often, so we don't think of it. We think of it as being as homogenous as what's in our pot. Um, but really, um, the soil uh, structure is very interesting down there. If if you were to take a, a section of it, um, a little little thin slice, and hold it up to the light, you would see it looks kind of like an ant farm. There, there's lots of holes and things down there. There's um, uh, moles and ants and all kinds of worms that they create all these channels. Some of them are created by animals and some of them just seem to be these strange structural things. But there's a lot of oxygen that gets down there. Uh, unless, of course, you're sitting in a swamp. But anyway, that's one of the reasons it's a little different. So we have to think about drying uh, the plant as it gets into watering um, and, and proper timing. Uh, so the uh, faster the wet dry cycle happens, um, is, is, the, the better the roots are uh, respiring and the faster the plant grows. Um, so you colonize that pot with roots faster. This is, so this is for young plants, right? This is what we're talking about, young plants. And then you pot it into a slightly bigger pot. Any questions on this one? Uh, Daryl had a comment. Uh, he says, mm -hmm. but isn't the water perch level much lower in a deeper mm -hmm. pot, which is not always a bigger pot? Uh, the perch level isn't an issue in the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, usually, usually it isn't an issue in the ground. That's right. Uh, in a in a deeper pot, that's right. The perch layer is pretty low, and 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 a deeper pot has a a much uh, uh, greater uh, plant health, uh, root health, uh, generally speaking. Um, I, th I think uh, what uh, than a shallow one. Uh, the uh, but we have to have enough roots to use that deep pot. So, um, so, so that's where, uh, you know, you can still have a deep pot, but have be it very, very narrow. So, you, you know, nursery pots are often taller than they are wide. And there's a reason for that um, uh, because that the health zone is in the middle, but if it's narrow, it's a very small amount of soil for a very small amount of roots and a very small plant. So, so you're slowly uh, stepping it up, but you're right. A, a, a deeper pot is, is going to be a healthier situation. It's only once we have a very established root system uh, and only on particular plants can go into shallow pots like maples and things like that. There's a lot of plants that don't like that at all. Many pines don't. If you want a pine in a shallow container, you need a, a pretty good mound on it. And then there's a lot of oxygen uh, for the, the root system that the pine prefers. That's a good question. Any others? Nicholas? Yeah, second question. Uh, Joshua yep. asks, what about a net pot or a pond basket? Have you found oh, yeah. those to help with speeding up development? Yeah, yeah, there's a fair, fair bit of, uh, of anecdotal evidence that they're pretty good, particularly in certain environments. Um, uh, if, if you live in a, with more humidity in areas of more humidity, they're a little bit more useful, uh, um, but it depends upon your situation. I mean, even, even there in, in, in uh, the slopes of the Rockies, you might you might do pretty well with it. You might even try that that two pond basket uh, thing. I, what I re recommend is is to go to Jonas's uh, site. His blog has at least one blog about pond baskets, I think. And and Jonas really breaks things down really well. I I, I highly recommend if you don't know Jonas's site, this is Bonsai Tonight, and he has I think one of the best blogs out there. He's uh, superb. Um, I'm pretty sure I saw something out there, but that's where I would I would send you because I haven't done any experiments of my own other than in my environment they go plants grow really really well. There's an awful lot of oxygen and the, and the root prune happens by air, and so you get this ramification. There's there's some there's some benefits, um, but I think there's also some examples where they don't work well with for certain certain plants. But anyway, <laughs> something to investigate. Any? I think that's uh, all the questions uh, for now, yep. sir. All right, sounds great. Thank you. Next one, growth enhancers. This is another thing that we all get very excited about. At least I sure did. If any of you haven't gotten excited about growth enhancers, I'm very jealous um, because uh, I wasted a lot of money on these things. 
<laughs> at least I consider I wasted money because it certainly didn't help me grow my plants any better. I didn't really know what I was doing. And I thought the growth enhancers would kind of make up for my faults, but that didn't happen, sadly. Uh, this was really fun to investigate. I had, I had some gut feelings about many of these, uh, having used them for, for some years on and off many years ago, things like super thrive. Um, I didn't have a, a lot of experience with HB 101, but I, I was curious about it. So I looked into it. I found it fascinating that there's virtually no, uh, science. Uh, th there's been very, very few studies about, there's some backyard studies, but th there's nothing that's been done in a lab. And I had a feeling that they were simply trying to avoid a lawsuit. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, the one that I, that, that I'm willing to say with confidence is snake oil is B1. Um, now this is, uh, um, th this is a, um, it's a vitamin, the thiamine. Uh, and the story behind this, I break this down. It's a really crazy story. And I actually had to buy a scholarly article. It wasn't available uh, on, the, on the line, um, <laughs> written by a science historian that told the story of this, which is crazy. It goes all the way back to the 30s. And there was this horticulturalist. I'll just give a, a snapshot of it. The, the details are in the, the book. But uh, it was a funny story. He thought he had found a new plant hormone. And plant hormones are rare. I mean, we only have a few of them. Um, it would have been huge news. And uh, he got some funding to study it. And somehow Better Homes and Gardens got wind of this and and um, of his statement that he thought he had found a, a hormone. Uh, and and it went wild. It, it, it became this big media storm. Um, and uh, right around the time that it did that, his studies were was we're proving that it actually wasn't uh, a hormone and it didn't actually promote anything <laughs> in terms of plant growth. Uh, and he finally, about three years later, he had to admit this. Um, uh, but that never made headline news. And B1 has been sold by a million different companies uh, for being a stress reliever for your plants. I, I used it for many years, uh, <laughs> diluted in water and you soak your plant in it when you're repotting. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> that will be used uh, or sold for many more years, I'm sure. Uh, so uh, this um, Linda Chalker Scott, it was wonderful to interview her. She's this horticulturalist that I mentioned who works up in, in Washington. Uh, she had a wonderful statement. She, she thought that uh, enhancers, she was very balanced about the whole thing. She said, you know, these growth enhancers, they have, they have nutrients in them. So yeah, they're probably going to do something. Um, but her question is, do they do any better than normal fertilizers? And for her observations, the, the answer is no, they really don't. And she's talking about your normal, you know, your fish emulsion or your uh, Dynagro or any of these sort of normal pedestrian, uh, easy to get and not very expensive fertilizers. I mean, if you compare um, some of the prices of these boutique uh, types of things, I mean, even Super Thrive, and you get like a four ounce bottle for... I don't know what it is now, $12, $15, something like that. It's a lot. Um, <laughs> and it's not really fertilizer, right? But however, uh, there's some really interesting uh, products out there um, that uh, have shown pretty convincing results. Um, and for many years, uh, humic acids uh, have been used for many years and have shown some really interesting results. I, I, I find it most interesting to look at primary research when you're looking at uh, people that grow the same age of plant, uh, the same species of plant, you know, people who do orchids, for instance, and they try something. And those are people I would trust, even if they're doing a, a, a you know, a greenhouse study in their backyard, if, if they got 50 plants they're playing with, and they're all the same age and whatnot, and all the same species, many of those studies are going to be better than what we hear about in our bonsai clubs, um, where our backyards are filled with all kinds of different species, all kinds of different ages, all kinds of different health or, you know, unhealth. And I mean, it's hard to make any studies unless we're very specific, uh, unless we're growing young plants, frankly. Uh, so humic acid is one. Seaweed is another one that's been used for uh, hundreds of years. And um, uh, the uh, research suggests that there's a lot of cytokinins in it. And I thought that was very interesting. I had a conversation with Peter Warren, um, how he said it, the first time he ever saw any significant backbudding on white pine, which is very difficult to do, was when he started using seaweed. 
and that made sense to me because of the cytokinins that have been found in that cytokinin is usually produced in the roots of plants comes up it's plant hormone comes up and it and it initiates uh buds very interesting <laughs> but it's been used for crop um uh, farmers uh, along coastlines for hundreds of years in many different countries. Silicone is another one to keep an eye on. Um, it, 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 several products, uh, let's see, Dynagro uh, creates one called Protect uh, as a liquid. And if you water that in, it, 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 it adds a silicon to, not silicone, but silicon, um, which is a mineral, uh, adds that uh, to the cell wall and it kind of stiffens it a little bit. Uh, as I understand it, and it, it does give a, a stress, um, sort of high heat, high sun uh, kind of advantage, um, uh, as well as a whole bunch of other things, you know, insect and fungal, there's a little bit of resistance to those sorts of uh, uh, problems. Uh, all those are not anecdotal. They're supported by some pretty good studies. So that's a pretty interesting one. And some of the others that I've talked about, you know, they might be supported someday, Super Thrive or HP 101, but they just, they haven't been yet. So maybe keep your money um, in your wallet <laughs> for some of those. Any questions about uh, growth enhancers? Um, two questions so far. So Michael, mm -hmm. uh, does seaweed contain humic acid or are those completely separate things? You know, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, humic acids are, are found in, in organic compounds and, um, you know, like compost and things like that. They might be found in, in seaweeds, uh, composted seaweeds, maybe. I, I really don't know the answer to that. That's an interesting question. Um, but in, in soils, um, you can find humic acids, uh, but, but they are created in laboratories and you can use them. But uh, in any event, um, uh, is there another question? Yeah. Since I uh, can't answer that one very well. <laughs> <laughs> Would kelp fall under this umbrella? Maybe it is the same as seaweed. Mm. I have seen mm. it marketed differently. Mm. Yeah, kelp, I believe it is a type of seaweed. Um, uh, in fact, there's many different species of seaweed and I, um, seaweed is, is quite a blanket. <laughs> and th this actually underlines, I didn't mention this, this underlines one of the big problems of using organics. Although, you know, honestly, I, I reluctantly <laughs> recommend uh, uh, organics for many different reasons, but, um, uh, but the problem with, if there is one, with the organics is, is source. Uh, so if you look at the back of Dynagro, you, you, which is a wonderful liquid, uh, and it has the biggest spread of micronutrients I've ever seen on the back of a, of a bottle, um, you know exactly what you're going to get in every tablespoon you put on. Uh, uh, if, if you're using uh, a, a oil cake, you have no idea what's in there. Um, they, you know, it's not listed anywhere, uh, you know, the exact percentage of, of, of all the micronutrients it's because the sources change. You know, these manufacturers are using, you know, the cheapest bag they can get of whatever. <laughs> so anyway, I'm, I'm making a dark story out of it, but you know, you, we don't really know. Uh, so if you use a cake, if you make it yourself, try and use as many different ingredients from as many different places as possible is what I would recommend and different sources, you know, animal, if, if you don't have a problem with that and, and, and plant, uh, uh, sources. Uh, that's what I would recommend. Anyway, <laughs> any other uh, question with that one? I think that's it for now. Okay. Marvelous. Wiring. Wiring. We all, well, some of us like wiring. Some of us don't really like wiring. And I, 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 I respect that. Um, even if you like wiring, copper wire is a pain in the ass, um, uh, especially if, if you don't have much experience with it. Uh, it's, it, it's going to make, um, inexperience with wire planning eight times worse. <laughs> so if you're, if you're new to wiring, wire with aluminum for a while. Uh, I highly recommend that. Once you, once you get some facility and fluency with it, maybe consider copper for your conifers. Uh, it, for a number of different reasons, it, it, it seems to be a good idea. And this is where I, I, I'm certainly in agreement with the tradition. I think they had the right ideas there. If you go to Japan, they use both copper and aluminum. You will, unless you're in somebody's bonsai garden, you will never see aluminum because in the shows, aluminum is taken off the deciduous trees. On the conifers, half of them, at least half of them, have are fully wired trees, in, even in the shows, and it's all copper. Um, the reason being, 
Uh, it's very strong, holds these springy branches of the conifers in place easily. It's a smaller diameter, so it's not so in your face. Uh, it's not so shiny. Uh, it um, creates a patina over time. Uh, it's great, so it's great for long term, uh, meaning you can leave it on for uh, several years. Um, uh, and it will look better and better. <laughs> in fact, it looks kind of like the bark eventually in many cases. Aluminum, on the other hand, um, is wonderful deciduous. It's, it's really soft. So when you apply it, you don't uh, damage the tender, kind of thin. You know, most deciduous trees at any rate have a fairly thin bark. It's shiny, so you can see it easily when you want to take it off. Uh, the anodized surface uh, can be really glaring, but often you only leave it on for a month and a half. By that point, your, your branch is swelling and it's stiffened to the point that uh, not only will it bite in, but it'll actually hold itself. Deciduous is entirely different than a conifer. A deciduous branch, you only need to wire once and it'll hold itself. A conifer branch, you might have to wire 10 times before it holds itself. Uh, and that could be 20 years out. <laughs> or 30 years or something like that for the conifer. In Japan, I remember seeing uh, some white pines that had uh, uh, wire on for over five years, actually. Um, uh, that was uh, a surprise to me. But then when I got home and I started wearing Ponderosa pine and discovered uh, 10 years later, I still had the wire, same wire on the tree. <laughs> By that point, the wire is black. <laughs> Because <laughs> while the acids in your water, if you're lucky enough to have acid rain or something like that, will we'll eventually patina the wire until it's black. If you use uh, copper wire and you use lime sulfur dormant spray, don't be surprised if the wire turns black. <laughs> uh, it'll make a mess. It might also stain your bark, so might might not do that for those plants. Any questions regarding wire? There's a lot to talk about here. Oh, the, uh, I should say that... Uh, these, uh, uh, the drawings on, on the left, they're all by Sergio. They're all from the, uh, uh, all from the book. Uh, and the 45, I should talk a little bit about this rather than just the uh, uh, types of, of, uh, of metal. Um, but uh, when I studied bonsai uh, back in the dark ages, the, uh, the guideline was 45. And it's a great guideline for something like a, a brittle plant, like a holly or a satsuki azalea or something like that. But it, it, it tends to be a really tight, angle for something like a, a pine spruce juniper something like that which is quite a bit more flexible you don't need such a tight it's probably not going to break on you uh, when you bend it um, and a longer spiral does far less damage uh, so a uh, couple of ideas there any questions with this chapter yeah yeah so with wire scars in the presence of them how often did you see wire scars on the trees in japan and oh. what is your opinion on those wire scars Oh yeah, there's a whole range there. There's you know, a little, little indentation on a on a conifer branch is almost almost needed. If 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 it if it doesn't get a little tight or bite in just a little bit, and I'm talking about you know maybe a quarter of a round. I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> so you're not burying the wire in it. That's the problem when you do that. But it, if if it bites in just just a hair, if it's getting a little tight, you want to wait at least that long. Uh, I did see wire scars in Japan, absolutely. Uh, in some cases, uh, it was uh, pretty bad, and those were in the uh, the really, really busy, uh, uh, productive uh, <laughs> gardens. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, even, uh, boy, even, even the deciduous stuff, uh, you, you could lose some. Uh, lose track of where, where you wired. In my backyard, we use little fluorescent flags and it's ugly as sin, but in my back 40 where we grow a lot of young plants, uh, there's some that have wire on them, some that don't. There's no way you can really see inside these bushy things, uh, these young plants that we're growing on. And so it's a little easier to tell which ones we need to take the wire off. <laughs> but uh, I, I didn't see that kind of notation in Japan, but um, uh, many, many of the trees in Japan are going at a different rate too. Um, they're older, more mature trees. Uh, when you put wire on, you can pretty much assume it's going to be on there a year, two, three years, uh, because the caliper growth on the branch is so slow. There's the trees are so mature. On the other hand, once you restyle a tree like that and cut off a bunch of branches, you've just made that tree 40 years younger and, <laughs> and, and the tree is going to bulk up a lot faster. And so your wire is going to bite in faster. And it, you, it definitely happens in japan there's some pretty bad wire scars over there <laughs> but uh they're, they're fairly serious about about keeping up on it though i i um i don't want to don't want to hit them hard because we have the same problems in our backyards right <laughs> any other questions uh so 
Yeah. The next question was for tropical trees, do you recommend aluminum as well? And if mm. so, would you need to just rewire more mm. often? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I consider tropical trees like deciduous trees in almost all respects. I mean, you can defoliate so many of them and they come back just like um, uh, just, just like deciduous trees and, and uh, aluminum wire seems to suit them really well. Now, any kind of a strong branch, even on a, um, on a deciduous tree, you can use a big piece of copper if, if you don't have the strength that you want uh, with aluminum, uh, but it's a good idea to wrap that, that copper with a little bit of tape. If you're doing that with a whole tree, you you know you're going to be adding twice the amount of time uh, <laughs> to it, so it's just easier to use a big aluminum. Uh, but uh, but for sub subtropical tropical plants, I'd recommend aluminum. It's easier to work with, and they set a little faster too. They're uh, f faster than conifers, so we we don't need to have them on them for forever, really. Yeah. Any and other I think questions? I misasked part of the question, but oh, uh, if, yep. if using aluminum wire on conifers, uh, would you just need to rewire more often? Oh, I understand. Um, yeah, it would be about the same schedule. Um, yeah, it, they're not going to bite in any faster. So, yeah. Might, might have to use uh, larger wires uh, just as, a, as an aside. Uh, Two, two smaller wires don't always add up to one bigger one. <laughs> There's something I don't understand physics very well, but a, a larger wire is going gonna, is gonna to be an awful lot stronger than two smaller ones that look the same mass. So anyway, uh, <laughs> um, uh, which is irritating if you're working with copper because copper is tricky to work with. <laughs> so but it goes for aluminum as well. Any other That's questions? That's it for here. All right. Thanks, Nicholas. I appreciate your helping out here. Okay, uh, watering. Oh, we love talking about water. No, I know we don't. Uh, when <laughs> when uh, students come to my seasonal classes, uh, I think Tom uh, uh, was part of this adventure. Uh, uh, we uh, we would study watering, <laughs> and um, it's tricky, especially especially. Are you there, Tom? Was that Tom? No. Wasn't Tom? Okay. No, um, I was I was muted, so sorry. Oh. Yes, I was there. Yes. Okay, we did that. Okay. I couldn't remember when we started that, but the, the more I taught, the more I realized we really had to had to study watering. It's sort of like I do some tango, and and uh, one of the jokes in the tango community is that the first thing you learn is is uh, is to walk. There's a certain <laughs> walk that you do in tango, and the last thing you learn to do is to walk because it's really really hard to do. <laughs> so to keep your balance and all. Anyway, uh, so uh, I consider these to be equatable. <laughs> watering is really really difficult. We have to know so much about bonsai to be able to water well. So I, I've been accused of, of saying it's an art and I think I have, I have actually said that and I apologize, it probably isn't really, but we just have to know a lot about, we have to be very intuitive about our plants um, and what, what their needs are. And I think one of the, the, the worst ways um, of, of achieving um, any kind of skill with our plants is to try automatic watering systems. And I know they're handy. We'll talk about, you know, when we can use them. Uh, but I, I don't, please don't rely on them because we begin to ignore our plants. Uh, and that's the worst thing. Um, the, the clues that we can get when we walk around with a can or with a hose are invaluable. The clues that tell us when a plant isn't doing well when it's doing too well, when it, <laughs> there's a lot of clues it can give us. Um, uh, if a, we just watered a plant and then, and then half hour later, it's dry again, that, that should be a clue um, that maybe we have a, hydro, a hydrophobic core, which we want to soak in a, in a, in a puddle of water, uh, before, which we kind of restart a, a normal wet dry cycle. Um, uh, there's some summer dormancy to consider. There's uh, in the fall when the plants start shutting down, our watering cycle has to change, uh, or or we're gonna we're gonna screw things up. So 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 the best way to actually weaken trees is to put them on uh, an automatic watering system. Some of them are gonna do great, and then there's gonna be a handful that are just gonna decline. Um, so. Uh, they are, however, useful. Automatic watering systems can be helpful, you know, when you go on break or something like that. Holiday, uh, when you're at work, real hot times of the day, maybe even misters or something like that. Um, 
uh, but don't rely on them. And, and if you do need to use them now and then, um, take really careful notes uh, when you are at home, figure out what's drying out, segment them or, or sort of uh, collate them according to, to what needs water twice a day, what needs water once a day, once, what needs water every other day. Uh, maybe really weak trees. Sometimes we, we don't water those uh, quite so frequently because they're not drying out their pots very, very much. They're physiologically not very active. Uh, and, and then every month you might want to go through and reassess and see if they should, are all on the right benches. Um, but that way, uh, if you have to ever water it uh, in the dark, <laughs> you know, which ones you should probably be watering. <laughs> uh, I, have, uh, I have actually several students and clients who need to water in the dark because their lives are very busy. <laughs> which uh, is terrifying to me but <laughs> this is a really long subject in fact i think this is the longest chapter in bones of heresy which i think is ridiculous i attempted to to write about something that we really have to learn in person in a lot of ways i i, I hope there's some some clues there that will help you think in certain ways uh toward your plants but it, i know it's very difficult this is where uh you know, it's funny, I write books about bonsai, but I, they're horrible. I don't read them. They, <laughs> uh, it's, um, <laughs> you, can, you can definitely understand you know, 100% of the information correctly uh, if, you, if you get information um, uh, through a book or video or something like that. The problem is that we can also fail 100% uh, in the misapplication of that, and, um, and a teacher can correct that. Uh, and, and this is the frustrating thing about bonsai. It's like the English language. It's just the, the, the more as many exceptions as there are rules, um, and uh, and and we don't really learn the exceptions except by by oops, <laughs> or or with 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 a teacher that can help you uh, prevent some oopses. Um, any questions uh, regarding uh, this huge subject of watering? Yes. Uh, so Kevin hmm. asks: Is there a shade cloth percentage that is best? Uh, hmm. sort of for universal use, um, maybe 30%, uh, given that Oregon just hit hundreds, you know, attempts in the hundreds, what did you have to do to protect your trees? Yeah, good question. Um, I have uh, several different uh, shade cloths in my yard uh, to allow for different needs uh, uh, for, for different plants. Um, I, I, as a general rule, I'd say start at 40 or, or, or so. Um, if, if you have deciduous trees, you're probably going to have to go to 50. If you have only conifers, you could do 20 or 30. Uh, that, that'll keep a lot of heat off your pots. It doesn't, it's not dark enough to really cause a trouble to, to pine, for instance. It just kind of takes a bit of the, uh, the intensity off. Uh, but, uh, but there's an awful lot of plants. If you, if you have a very uh, uh, varied uh, collection, uh, then you might want 50% in one area and 20% in another, something like that. There's a lot of companies out there that allow you to create a custom shade cloth of any size, any percentage. Well, not any, but every five or 10%, you know, there's something like that. Uh, and um, definitely get a knit one. Uh, the knit uh, prevents, uh, if it gets a tear and it won't, won't go all the way down. <laughs> so it stops the tear. Um, so, uh, shade cloth is a great idea. You, you have a really intense sun out there in the, in, in the Rockies and in, in uh, Colorado. And, um, that's, uh, that's something, something that your plants will thank you for, uh, for sure. Maybe also little misters, but, <laughs> uh, did I answer that question completely? I can't remember. If I... Uh, I, I think so. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess Kevin can let us know if he has some additional follow-up. Okay. Um, maybe you answered part of this, but Rich would like to know mm -hmm. um, your opinions about shade cloth uh, density. Is this informed by, or is it relevant to the intensity of the experience in Colorado, I guess? Oh, the intensity of the light? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I used to live in Arizona, and I had, I had pines under 50%. It was really intense down there at 4,000 feet or so. Uh, I, I think, it, and I did have some deciduous as well. I, I, I would recommend at least 50, 55 if you have uh, deciduous trees with the kind of intensity you have. And uh, yeah, we did, we, we had over hundred, we had the highest temperature I've ever seen in Portland, uh, the uh, 112 in my backyard. Another part of Portland hit 116, which is unheard of. Uh, the highest temperature I've ever seen here was 106. And that was in 2009. So this blew that one out of the water. 
um intensity was was pretty good yeah <laughs> my apprentices were out speaking of watering they were out uh every hour um i i had a it, the timing couldn't have been better i had apprentices changing so i usually request an overlap so that the administration of the yard can be passed on um and that was happening so they could give each other a break but they were out there every hour um just doing some evaporative cooling watering not necessarily watering the, the pot although they, they did multiple waterings uh on those days but but just cooling down the yard which is something else you might think about if you if uh, you could try some misting systems or, or whatnot. It's, it's a lot of water, I know. And, and we're all getting a little low on water in some areas. So it's, it's something to weigh, you know? Yeah. Any other question? I keep going off on tangents with these, <laughs> not answering we, directly. We I love apologize. it. It's beautiful. Um, so <laughs> okay. I think we're okay on questions. Kevin said you, you okay, answered great. his question. Great, great. I did want to give a shout out to uh, Sergio Kwan, who did all of these illustrations that are here, um, which are actually coming out in a calendar and a few other fun merch things that we're doing together. <laughs> Just to have a little bit of fun. Uh, but uh, this was the first illustration he did. And I want to tell a quick little story. Uh, this was, uh, we've been working together for six months and uh, I was getting really excited about, uh, I mean, he seemed to totally understand what I wanted. And he, I was seeing these these black and white drawings. I was like, oh, this is, this is great. I usually send a couple options. And uh, I didn't tell him what to do. Uh, the only thing that I, uh, I said is, I, I think we need an illustration for this chapter. And then we'll do this one. And, and, and then he would just go off for a couple of weeks. And then he'd send me a few ideas. And often I would just be rolling on the ground. I was laughing so hard. <laughs> but this is the first one that I, that, that I got. And I, I was actually starting to get a little nervous because it was like October and our, our due date was, uh, I mean, the wrap up date to go to printing was uh, December 31st. So I was starting to get really worried. I hadn't seen any of them, <laughs> any of the color ones. So I, I, I called him in a panic one day. And, and uh, anyway, for a few, <laughs> a few days later, he, he sent me this, this first one and I, I absolutely loved it. I, I realized we were absolutely on the same page that I wanted something that was that, that was so opposite of Wabi Sabi that it couldn't be missed. Um, <laughs> and he nailed it. And so I remember, I think I took an a hour off of work. I was so happy. I just walked around for a while. Anyway, Ser there's that story. Sergio, Sergio, was, Sergio, <laughs> Sergio. Was, was with us a few months ago. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, wonderful. Nice. Yeah, I know he's doing presentations, isn't he? Yeah, a hoot? yeah he's, he's, a, he's a marvelous guy. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully we'll have him in person next year. Yeah, yeah, he would, he would love that. Yeah. So uh, let's, uh, this section is a little shorter, um, uh, aesthetic myths, uh, which there are a few, I think. Um, bar branches are one. Uh, so for those unfamiliar with the bar branch, bar branch is if you have a trunk and you have a branch coming off of one side of the trunk, there's another branch coming off exactly opposite of that. So it looks like a T. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a bar branch. And a bar branch is one of these uh, taboo branches. Uh, so there was a um, there was a Japanese publication of uh, early 1800s, uh, which showed all kinds of uh, very naughty uh, branch uh, positions, and the, and the bar branch is one of them. Um, the, the reason that it's naughty is that symmetry is naughty uh, in bonsai. Uh, in, in most of the Japanese arts, uh, you, you find uh, that there's a, uh, there, there's a lack of symmetry, there's an asymmetry, and they try to find balance within asymmetry. In fact, there's even some of the, the most famous architecture, uh, some of the, uh, the um, uh, some of the major uh, uh, important dwellings over there of the aristocracy were, were based on asymmetrical. Um, uh, you know, you go to Europe and you find these very symmetrical things in many places, but 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 in Japan it's entirely different. Um, so anyway, that's why it's naughty. <laughs> um, however, uh, let me give you a few ideas. Um, uh, as I did put that in quotes, and it's not the greatest thing. I mean, 90% of the time, yeah, you probably don't want that opposite branch. However, let's say that you're working with the Yamadori and the tree has three branches. And if you cut one of them off, you barely have a tree left. Um, in that case, you might want to hide it. And there are various ways you could do that. You could do that with the front uh, selection. Uh, you could try to keep one branch smaller uh, than the opposite one that will often shift uh, symmetry. Um, and then another idea is scale. Uh, so on large scale, sometimes this can be a little bit in our face, but on the small scale, we can almost miss it. So if you look at some of the Kokofu books, for instance, if you, if you haven't been to Japan, excuse me, look at uh, the Shohin deciduous trees, and you will notice that uh, many of them have branches that come off 
essentially opposite one another. Uh, probably when they were started, they were slightly staggered, but as the branch develops girth and the trunk develops girth, they, you know, it all kind of blends together and they look pretty opposite. Uh, and so the artists didn't cut off all the branches because, oh my gosh, there was, there was a bar branch happening because then you get a scar and then you get a big hole in your tree. So one of the things that I'm probably going to hammer away at a little bit here in this aesthetic section is that we tend to create very thin trees in the West. Uh, we seem to be so married to these rules that we forget that a, that a, that a tree that uh, is not only full, but it's balanced is, is really the most important thing. So we have to choose whether we're going to follow <laughs> uh, some of these guidelines, uh, but to keep the sort of the greater good for you, uh, Harry Potter fans, uh, <laughs> to, not at the expense of the greater good. Um, so uh, uh, any questions, uh, Nicholas, with this one? Uh, no questions on this one. Okay, right. There's another French Revolution attribution. The reply of the Royalist, pocket branches must die. Uh, the uh, pocket branch is another uh, uh, nasty branch uh, design. Um, it is a uh, <laughs> something that might happen if you have, this is a, a trunk line here uh, with, with a strong curve in it, and you have a branch that is arriving right in the middle of the curve. That doesn't look very good. That, that generally speaking, you're going to, I don't know if you guys saw that. I don't know where my camera is, but uh, so uh, usually, you know, especially that the tighter that curve is, the more constricted and claustrophobic this is going to get. So you're probably going to want to cut that branch out so you can see the curve. Usually we want the branches coming in the outside of the curve. These, these are the guidelines and they make sense. On the other hand, what happens when we have a tree with very little curve, with a very, very subtle movement? In that instance, I think you can throw this idea out, especially because in many cases, you're, you're going to apply some um, uh, sort of Bunjin uh, sensibility to a skinny uh, trunk tree. And we can begin to kind of uh, do some taboo breaking rules uh, there uh, with that type of a tree. So um, pocket branches uh, uh, might be necessary for balance and balance uh, uh, definitely is the uh, overarching idea, <laughs> over rules. Um, and this is visual balance, yeah? So uh, weighted, uh, where things are weighted. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that it, it's not so important. And for you Yamadori lovers, if you, if you like Yamadori, uh, this can give you some confidence. It doesn't really matter where the branch uh, arises from. It matters where it ends up, where, the, where, where your foliage mass ends up. And if you're lucky, the branch itself might be interesting. It might have some shari on it or an interesting movement or something like that. Um, but to go back to the, to, to the main point, if you have a tree with a slower curve, um, uh, those trees don't really have pockets. And of course, form, formal uprights don't either. That's, that's the extreme where you don't have to worry about this rule at all. Uh, but for a moyogi or a, a bankan, bankan means twisted, twisted style. Uh, which is fairly unusual. Usually it's called bunjin, but that's completely erroneous. Uh, but this is one of these really twisted up plants that you can, you know, some of the ponderosas do that up, up in the mountains. Any questions here, Nicholas? No, sir. Oh, all right. Great. Uh, pigeon, pigeon breasts uh, is another uh, it's another horrible thing. Uh, <laughs> so uh, pigeon breast is uh, uh, talking about the trunk. Uh, so not branches anymore, we're on a trunk. So the uh, pigeon breast is uh, a movement about, is somewhere up in the, the, the upper part of the tree that's moving toward, it can be even the lower part, <laughs> where the, the trunk itself is moving kind of uh, uh, impressively or aggressively toward the viewer. Um, and uh, that's considered not very inviting. Uh, to the uh, Japanese sensibility, which uh, has kind of a, the traditional framework of, uh, of a bonsai, uh, a well-styled bonsai is a fairly passive uh, kind of style. Um, and, uh, and I think this is one that we can be, um, can, can really uh, help ourselves to be very clear about our intention. Do we want to uh, run in that direction? uh or or around the, the tight end and 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 uh, <laughs> and and use a a, a, a very uh a, a sort of aggressive movement toward the view to activate a design now this is where fronts get into this uh because the most interesting uh front is going to be your most interesting trunk line 
So if you can imagine uh, a trunk line with a very interesting curve, um, uh, but from that front, uh, or the, the most interesting front, the most active front, uh, the most engaging front, the most unexpected front, unfortunately, this has a pigeon breast. Well, this is where you might want to throw out this rule because the front is the most important thing. All of these things, I'm going to make this point again. All of these things that we've been covering, the bar branch, the pocket branch, the pigeon breast, all the, and there's another one that's coming up. All of these uh, are secondary rules. The primary rule is the interest of the front, the interest in the trunk line. Uh, so if you go to Japan, and this is something you can't really see uh, very easily at any rate uh, through most of the photography, uh, is that there are quite a few uh, bonsai in Japan that actually have pigeon breasts. So you can go there and start shaking your head and think, gosh, they're not a, just following their own rules here. Um, <laughs> well, many of those are, are Yamadori plants. <clears throat> um, uh, but this is where your own sensibility uh, can, can come into play and, and uh, can, can create a much more jazzy kind of uh, composition. Read the tree. Uh, not the book. <laughs> so, speaking of books, uh, Nicholas, any uh, uh, any questions here? No questions on pigeon breast. All right, great. Uh, S curves. Uh, so an S curve is a uh, is something that we see uh, on a lot of trees because um, they're very easy to create. In fact, they, we we create them without thinking about it. <laughs> it's very strange. Uh, but it, it's easy to appreciate also, it's, it's sort of like um, photorealistic painting or something. A lot of people can kind of appreciate it. Um, uh, and we think that's, uh, you know, that's the best. Uh, but using uh, an S-curve as a front uh, does kind of have, uh, as I said in, in Bonsai Heresy, it seems to have the ghost of the, the Miyogi pine in it because this is sort of the, the old traditional framework. Uh, that goes back uh, over 200 years uh, now, probably almost 300 years. Um, and if we are using this kind of an idea, uh, uh, the S curve uh, for a trunk line for a different kind of plant, uh, let, let's say if you try to do that with a cryptomeria or a redwood um, or um, even a Styrax or something like that, it might not look right. Um, uh, so consider that. Um, uh, th there's some genetically um, uh, predetermined movements. <laughs> and uh, uh, and, and take, take a look. I mean, we have, we have fall, winter coming up here. Take a look at, at, at how some of these plants are growing out in the wild. What I would recommend is to seek unusual movement. Um, and, and, uh, and also, if, if you like creating young plants, uh, try to wire unusual movement. And this is really challenging. If you're doing a trunk, challenging. If you're doing a branch, challenging. We tend to create S movements in branches for many different reasons, some of them very good. Uh, but they also create kind of this harmonic that is uh, a little strange for, the, for naturalness at any rate. So for, as, a, as an exercise, uh, as a group, as a club, maybe I would challenge you to maybe wire uh, it doesn't even have to be a, a plant. It, it could be it could be another wire, <laughs> a big thick piece of wire with a wire, and then try to, to create um, uh, try to create a a movement that it is in, is in an S curve. It is not easy. Um, we move something one way, and then we move something another way, and that's an S curve. <laughs> so try to think in three D. That might help you a little bit, uh, but to create it an an erratic uh, pattern. Um, is uh, is a lot of fun, and there's a few tricks to it, and I'm, you, you'll 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 figure it out. But I, I love this illustration of Sergio. So so this is the best front with the S, and uh, the, the the ones that were um, uh, sent packing was the D A and T uh, fronts. <laughs> He's such a goof. Uh, any questions here on S curves? No questions. Okay, right. Uh, this is the last one in this uh, segment, uh, which is uh, more movement, uh, more better. And I, th I think this is quite natural. I think whenever we, whenever we learn an art, you know, you know, you go to absurdity with it. Um, and uh, more always seems sort of better. Um, and, uh, and, th and then you go 
uh, this happened to me. I went to Japan and I, I stood in front of a tree. I mean, there's this flood of people going by and I, I, I couldn't move. I was so rooted uh, with a, a tree that had a bit of reverse taper and it was a formal upright. <laughs> and it was the most astonishing plant um, in the whole bloody show. And it had no movement whatsoever. <laughs> so when you have experiences like that, you start thinking, wait a minute, <laughs> um, especially with young plants, though, it makes total sense. If it's a young plant, a stick, you know, isn't, isn't going to be very interesting. So you put some movement in it. And you can think of it as, mu as music, you know, you, you put a little jazz in it, you put a little, little bit of little, little bit more tempo. So it doesn't have a dead heartbeat. Um, but in so doing, you can end up with a lot of things with an awful lot of movement and not have this, this whole other range of language uh, that trees also have. Um, so even though bonsai is a construct and we're kind of inventing our, our, our fictions to, to some degree, there's also a lot of things out in nature that, that have nothing to do with these, these uh, heavy curves that we tend to, tend to create. Uh, the older the tree is, uh, the, the, the less uh, rules can be, can be helpful to us, um, I think it's still really useful to learn these rules uh, or guidelines. It's probably better to consider them guidelines. Um, but the front, uh, I wanna get back to this one at least once. The front is the primary guideline. Uh, all these others that we've been talking about, they're important, but they're all subservient. Um, keep turning your pot and change your inclination. Find the most engaging trunk line and inclination to engage the viewer. The inclination is one of the tools you can use to engage or, or, or to sort of pacify the image if it's maybe too active, that happens as well. And then your inclination can kind of relax that a little bit. But that front, you know, the, the front line of that is, is, is a critical one. Spend a lot of time on that. Spend, spend a couple of years if you want, especially if you collected a tree or just got it from the nursery. It's going to take a little while anyway to get it anywhere you might not style your tree for a while take those two moments to uh bring friends in your backyard and get if you each want a chopstick and say where's the front and give them a few blocks and have them tip it around a little bit and take a bunch of photographs you don't have to agree with your friends but uh, honor them by taking a photograph of their fronts and then later you can argue about it <laughs> it's amazing what you can be convinced of uh three years down the road ideas that you thought were horrible uh can make more sense later <laughs> so uh, any uh, any questions here um, on movement? One question, perhaps that's yes. kind of what you're getting at. Uh, how often do you find mm -hmm. uh, you repot a tree and you keep the same line or front from the previous potting? Oh, if it's an established tree, it's uh, almost the same front. Um, uh, occasionally, you re you can restyle even an established tree. Uh, so when that happens, then then often you're you're carving away at the, the root ball to, to fit it in a, in a different inclination. <laughs> um, you're taking off surface roots and, you know, lots of things change if, if you're convinced a different uh, uh, front or inclination is there. But, but for the vast majority of the time, you're planting very similar to, to the same front. But, 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 you know, most plants are in, in the pot for several years. And as you're watering and as you're enjoying your plants, uh, you might well get, get other ideas. I've, I've changed plants 180 degrees before. Uh, many times, <laughs> actually. <laughs> and occasionally it was from a friend, you know, who came into the yard and said, you know, I'm really appreciating this friend over here. And, oh. So uh, take, take notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Any other questions? I, yes. Yeah, just a, a yeah. question from Carrie. I think she's visiting Portland in September and wanted to know if you're doing uh, tours or if she can visit uh, your gardens. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. If you can find my website, you can send me a, a, an email. And uh, I'd be happy to um, um, invite anybody in. Yep. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That's yep. it. For our, ta now. our tasting fee is is uh, very low right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've never never had one, but that's a joke with the apprentices that we should have a tasting fee, and then we can all go out for lunch. But it doesn't happen. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Zafon uh, has written uh, several wonderful novels. One of my favorite novelists, uh, Shadow of the Wind, is a wonderful novel uh, if you if you like kind of magical realism kind of stuff. <laughs> but his, his his character says something absolutely hilarious, which I thought had a lot to do with uh, my experience in bonsai and how much I was talking, and I probably shouldn't have been talking, uh, but uh, <laughs> people talk too much. Humans aren't descended from monkeys; they come from parrots. <laughs> I thought that was really accurate. And then my friend Gary Wood uh, has this wonderful phrase. <laughs> Doing it right takes a long time. Doing it wrong takes forever. 
<laughs> bonsai is really pretty perfect. Um, but uh, so Sergio did one last little illustration and sent sent me. <laughs> so the cover of this book has this flaming match, and uh, uh, so this, <laughs> this was a spent match. I actually have a funny story about the uh, the cover. Uh, which uh, I hope you can remember it. I don't want to go all the way back, but it's this flaming uh, match head. And I made the mistake of sending, uh, just for uh, his thoughts, I sent this to Jonas Dupuy um, and uh, asking his opinion about, about, about our cover. And, uh, and he said when he, w when he opened it, he only saw the, the top half of the image and it looked to him like a head was exploding on fire and it, and it terrified him. <laughs> And I'm glad he was one of the first persons uh, that, that I sent this to because thereafter I only sent them as texts, uh, an image and a text, so nobody would have a half an image. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, thank you so much for having me here tonight. Um, uh, this was a really fun project, and I do want to give a shout out to everybody who was a part of this team. Mary Russell, who also was my um, copy editor for um, my first book, Post Dated, which is a memoir of my apprenticeship, Sergio Quan, of course. Uh, who we've been talking about here. John, Jennifer Omner was my book designer uh, for uh, my first and second books. I was glad to get her uh, just as she was retiring. Uh, my mom uh, helped us with a bibliography and was a lot of fun to have on the project. Lauren Elsa was a proofreader. And then I had about 10 uh, or 12 <laughs> um, content editors who really improved this. Um, so thank you so much. Um, this was fun. Any, any final questions or, or thoughts or? Arguments. <laughs> Michael, if uh, people are interested in buying your books, can they yes. buy them on your website or should they go to Amazon? Or what, what's oh, the you can learn a little bit uh, about the book uh, on my website, and there's a link there uh, to go to Stone Lantern. I don't sell any of them myself. Uh, okay. uh, Wayne Shea of Stone Lantern is uh, my distributor. It's not available on, on Amazon. If you sell books, you know why. Um, <laughs> It's a great place to buy things. It's a horrible place to sell things, but at least if it's a solid thing, <laughs> I think they do well with eBooks, but anyway, don't get me going with Amazon. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Uh, the answer is Stone Lantern. Um, and you can learn about both books and he sells post dated as well. Um, yeah. but you can learn, learn about both books on my website as well. I would, I would encourage everybody if you're interested in buying Michael's current book to buy his previous book, the, uh, bonsai moth book that's really very entertaining and and revealing actually so buy both of them <laughs> thanks tom <laughs> thank, nice. thank you for being here michael oh really, yeah it was a pleasure this and i really look nice. forward i look forward i haven't been up in portland since for a year and a half but the next time i get up there i will visit you for sure thank you thank you say hi to florentina it's yeah. Um, I had a question. Hi, Michael. How are you doing? Kevin, hi um, there. <laughs> hey. How are you? Not bad. I'll That's be in good. town in the, the next two weeks, so maybe I can stop by if I have. Oh, Bye. definitely. Please do. Um, I know, as you said, before quarantine and all the craziness the pandemic hit, you're going to try an Amtrak tour. Are you still thinking about doing that? I sure or am. Everything back to <laughs> I sure am. And I still know when it's going to happen. It's just, you know, yeah, it just keeps getting punted down that, the road. Yeah. Uh, but my latest thought is sometime next year, maybe April. Um, cool. But I, I don't know. <laughs> right. I, it's, uh, it, it might even be okay. next September, but uh, I, I really don't know. I, um, uh, I'm so excited to do it, though. I think it'd be really fun to, to talk mm -hmm. to people. It wouldn't really be so much of a, a, a book tour as, a, you, you know, what questions came up, because this was a book that I think, you know, raised nearly as many questions as it might have answered. Um, and, and it's a work in progress. I mean, there's already some things that uh, uh, I'll be creating a, a new presentation for that tour because there's already things that uh, have come to light that I think are, are a little different and interesting to, uh, to, to talk about. And other pe people have written me and, and said, have you considered this? And I'll definitely uh, uh, do a revision of the book at some point. But to answer your question, yeah, I am thinking of that. And I also hope actually have my next book out uh, by the time of that tour, whenever that is, which uh, I, is um, it, is actually not about bonsai. I, I went a little sideways the last two years. <laughs> um, I wrote a, a, a it's almost almost finished. We're we're starting um, starting the editing process shortly here, but it's about the experience of living in a tiny home, which I've been living in for almost four years now. 
uh, built a tiny home in, in uh, 2017, and it's been a, a real blessing in my life. And I, I realized I had kind of a, a strange story to tell <laughs> about it, uh, about downsizing, <laughs> which isn't how, how many people end up in tiny homes. But uh, anyway, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm doing a lot of interviewing actually right now. I'm very curious about uh, some people who are feel forced to live in you know, minimally because they have no other options. Uh, so cities like mine are, are gentrifying so fast that they're, they're pushing people out of their usual options. So it's a, it's part it, it, though it's a memoir. I did want to see what other people's experiences are. So anyway, that's coming out sometime next year. I don't know when. Yeah. yeah I'll shoot you an email and then maybe we can link up or something. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be great. Kevin. Yeah, it'd be good to see you. Wonderful. Any more questions? I see there's some, there's some chats that are coming in, but my mouse isn't working, so I can't seem to read any of these. <laughs> I think one question, uh, Daryl Whitley said, uh, I'm going to, Daryl, did you want to unmute and just ask here? There he is. Sure. Hi, Michael. I was in, uh, I was hey. in Nagano for in 2019 and visited the gardens out in Obuse. Um, oh, yeah. They kept telling me you need to graph your Rocky Mountain juniper with Shumpaku. I mean, they were pretty adamant about it. Uh, <laughs> I was curious what you think. Yeah, um, Rocky is a, um, uh, it, it's a really variable plant. I have uh, a, a number of them in the yard that I've grafted. And I, I agree with that for the, for the most part, um, that it, it's a plant that actually is really difficult to take care of uh, well. Um, and uh, whoops, sorry, I got out of that here i can stop sharing that would be a little more interesting for everyone um <laughs> there um the um and then i i found some uh some genetics of of that that species are, are really tight and i have one in the backyard that looks like a toagawa and i've never grafted it it's, a, it's an amazing little tree um, so uh, there's so much variation, color variation, everything. And that's common throughout the juniper. I mean, you look at Juniperus chinensis, uh, there's just a whole range of, of uh, 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 needle types uh, there. But to answer your question, I would, I would say for, for most people's, um, unless you've been highly trained in, uh, in managing Rocky, which is a fairly challenging juniper, um, we could talk briefly about that, but I, I think for most people, grafting is, is, is probably your, your easiest solution. Of course, you live in a pretty good environment for them. They like living there. Uh, so, so you can play that into your thought pattern too, but they're easy to over fertilize and then they get really needly. Um, it's, it's challenging to create, create a pad unless, uh, you're, you're willing to, uh, to cut them back with scissors at least twice a year. It can take, uh, many more years to create a, a dense pad than, uh, a shimpaku, which could do it in three. So it, um, you can, I mean, if showing is of interest to you, uh, um, you can get a tree in a show in no time <laughs> um, at all. And they look great. I mean, the shimpakus that we've uh, grafted onto Rocky look just absolutely amazing. Um, wow. uh, of course, there's a lot of people don't like that. And I, I respect that, you know, grafting is, is not seen appreciatively by everybody. So, Well, I'll just share. I think Obuse has the best soba in all of Japan. It's just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they, I guess they, well, they grow buckwheat there. That's one of their main, main probably, you, you know that. Yeah. And then I think, uh, what was it? Uh, hazelnut or? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Was it hazelnut? That, that was it. And then they grow apples and pears and things as well. But uh, yeah, agricultural valley, very high, very cold, 3000 foot valley. <laughs> that was very cold. Thank <laughs> For you. those, th yeah, absolutely. For those of you who, uh, yeah. <laughs> who want to read some crazy stories. Tom was talking about my first book, Post Dated, where I talk about uh, how my toilet bowl froze solid at least once a, a winter. It's usually a couple times a winter. And uh, this was a, the house that I was living in was a traditional Japanese house. And there's, uh, there's um, both the heating and insulation is a very different animal from what we're used to. <laughs> so uh, you have these little kerosene heater, heaters in each room and you turn them off as you, as you kind of vacate the rooms back to the, to the, to the final room in, in the bedroom where you turn off your kerosene heater last thing at night. That's the well, first one that you put on in the morning. Too. <laughs> anyway, any other questions? Yeah, Michael. Hi, Michael. Oh my Could gosh. 
Hi, how are Hi. you? Good to see you. Could you say something about your classes, your seasonal classes, both the uh, the ones oh, online yeah. and, and the ones you're doing in person? Yeah, we do some in person, which uh, would require you to travel to, to Portland. Um, and uh, we do those four times a year um, and uh, for a couple of years, uh, though you don't have to complete that in any kind of a process. But uh, that's been a fun program. I've been doing that for about 14 years now. Um, we started in my garage. I'm glad, Ron, you weren't part of that. I don't I don't know. Tom, Tom wasn't either. I think Tom was in the studio by that point. But some of the earlier ones. Oh, those poor people. Uh, we- <laughs> In any event, uh, <laughs> it's it's been a lot of fun, and we've actually created some of the uh, uh, um, uh, some of my favorite bonsai in the yard came out of those early years. <laughs> uh, but I have what what I consider as a teaching collection in my yard. I don't do um, as much selling as some people, although I do have some products, including chochaba and things like that. But uh, and some uh, uh, backcountry. Uh, bonsai supplies me with plants that we then work on and sell but 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 the the collection is primarily for students uh so you can uh, my goal was to create a collection that that i wouldn't sell that i would uh maintain and 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 uh keep at a high level of development so that students can learn kind of where they're going that's sort that was sort of the whole purpose and that's what i started studying with when i started with boone uh, i studied with him for three years then i went to japan uh for another three and and that was um uh what i found was the most beneficial way to uh, to learn an awful lot of skills uh, at once uh, if you're working on trees that are highly developed and tom my trees are much more developed than when you were studying with me <laughs> so it's a very different story now but also uh, along with what ron was saying i also have i know it's it's, it's a long way to come uh and uh if if you're not sick of zoom yet uh, <laughs> i do have uh, uh the seasonal light series uh which is uh covering sort of three major times of the year and what we do during those times. And it's a, it's a weekend course and I do it every year. Um, you're welcome to take part in that. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, uh, people from all over the world. Last time we did this, we had people from uh, uh, three places in Europe and one in, in Australia. <laughs> so it keeps going. It's a lot of, a lot of fun. One, one poor person from Australia got up at one in the morning and was awake until four uh for two nights <laughs> so, well, anyway you won't have to do that <laughs> anyway michael, thank you ron <laughs> michael speaking of uh getting up early uh a few months ago we had a presentation from jan kulik from the czech republic oh jan and he yeah and when he, was <laughs> he, he was he was up at three o'clock in the morning <laughs> present to us virtually <laughs> oh darn the young <laughs> but, he you did, know, but he did i would have job. said no i wouldn't have been able to do that i'm just a little little too long in the tooth these days but jan is a hoot and he's a great artist i'm glad he's you guys great. had him he really is good yeah good for but, you for going but, that you know, far afield about, the other thing is about what six or seven years ago i bought a scots pine from telperion uh, and I brought it to Michael's workshop oh, or his right, class, right. and we did some initial styling on it. And then I went away for several years, and, and finally Michael said, "Well, what the hell do you want me to do with this Scots pot?" I said, "You've had it so long, keep it." <laughs> so hopefully, it's doing well. It's doing very well. Yeah, yeah. I feel guilty every day, no, every time I pass it. Yeah, you it shouldn't. doesn't feel right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh we're gonna wire it this uh this winter at some point or my apprentice will we're gonna we're gonna stick around that one and we'll we'll send you a, send a result a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll have to come visit yeah absolutely okay <laughs> thank you so much very very good yeah yeah any other last hellos or goodbyes I see you guys have been online for a while now. I would like to ask a question, but I'm getting so much static. I don't know. Can you understand me? Yes. Yes, yes we can. Okay. Um, I'm relatively new, meaning within the last five or so, ten years, doing it. And um, having a real challenge with keeping them alive in the winter, in our climate. Hmm. Um, and my new husband has said, you realize 
that we're not going to be in this house with the garden for very long. We're going to be going to wherever we go to. And so maybe you need to get into tropicals more. Oh, well, that's one way to do it. Yeah, you could try that. I, 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 love, I love gardening and I have house plants. So what, it, what might be your recommendation in the um, area of tropicals? Uh, and that, those are not plants that I work with too much, but not far away. You have one of our masters, uh, Jerry Meislick, uh, works with um, tropicals and he works with a lot of ficus um, and others, uh, I believe. Uh, there's quite a few things that you can try, but ficus is one of the best to start with. You might try like a narrow leaf uh, uh, fig to begin with or something like that. Um, Bert Davii, something that'll be uh, not too temperamental for you. Uh, but that's a whole world of, of possibilities, a lot of really fun ones. If you got a big window with a lot of light, that's great. If you don't, you can get some uh, uh, high-intensity fluorescence or even LEDs uh, that can replicate uh, daylight. Um, and, and, then, uh, and then be sure you get a place with a big window. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, uh, right, right, now, lights, so. right, right now in my basement, I have uh, uh, lights and stands because I've started uh, lots of plants to go out in the garden. I mean, I, I'm a gardener, so I do a whole mm. lot of that. And, mm. and in the winter, I, I bring my ficus in. Hmm. under the grow lux lights etc i just oh, yeah. wondered if you had any particular advice of any particular other than ficus i do i have jade oh sure yeah yeah the little leaf uh can be a really nice plant uh elephant food uh, uh you, you know because I, I don't work with them too much i'm, I'm hesitant to, to suggest any i i have worked on many but they're uh they're really interesting uh interesting uh, many many varied 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 plants um but uh other, other than figs I, I think that's a place to start but i would i would actually get some expertise i, I would talk with jerry if uh uh does he do any teaching anymore in fact i, I don't know he, Tom, he made it heard? he made a presentation to our club a couple of months ago oh yeah okay so okay and and uh, and we offered his new book which is about ficus Oh great! Uh, so he's uh, he's very well. We are all very well aware of him. Yes, for sure. Yeah, yeah. A in, place uh, to begin. Whitefish, Montana. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's done, he's a great resource. Um, um, but there's uh, there's a lot of different plants you can grow. I, again, I don't. I I'm hesitant to throw things out there. <laughs> sure. um, but fine. they're easy to Good. grow, and uh, they grow a lot like deciduous trees. So if you're a gardener, many things will be familiar to you. Um, and, and, and putting them out in, in, in the, uh, in the sun, uh, is not a bad idea. Um, uh, the more your plant can grow outdoors, the stronger it'll be usually in most cases. Um, but, uh, uh, keep an eye out for pests inside. That's all I would say is that you can, they can get it, get ahead of you pretty quick. <laughs> so, yeah. Any, any other questions? Well, that sounds like we're sounds like we're probably at the end, Michael. So okay, great. Thank, thank you very you much so for much. the presentation. I really enjoyed it. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mike.